So the idea from the beginning was to uh, write a book that, in which students in introductory courses could encounter many of the topics they normally encountered in an Introduction to American Democracy course, but one which would be a little more critical in that beyond simply describing uh, institutions and processes, uh, it raised the question of democracy. Do these institutions and processes operate in a democratic manner? Uh, and to make students think about, uh, rather than simply assuming, uh, because we all call America a democracy, and I think that's justified, uh, but to think about uh, to what extent a democracy. Uh, are there ways in which American democracy falls short and might be improved? Well, the title, uh, actually, it's, it's always difficult to come up with a title for a book. You usually think of a book and what you're going to talk about, and then the question is, well, what are we going to call this thing? Uh, and uh, publishers obviously want catchy titles. They want to make sure that the book attracts attention. And so, uh, actually, I remember we had a long discussion with uh, uh, Bob Trudeau was involved, and actually his wife, I remember we had a dinner, uh, and my wife was there, and it was like, uh, well, what can we call this? And it was actually my wife, Lorette, who came up with the notion, in peril, uh, that what you're talking about is a democracy that uh, has problems that put it at risk to some extent. Um, uh, but we thought peril was a little more euphonious than risk, so we said, we'll call it American Democracy in Peril. And eight challenges to democracy now. And again, challenges, uh, I thought carefully about that word because I didn't want to say defects or something as bland as problems or issues, but wanted to talk about the peril in terms of problems facing American democracy, but problems that can be dealt with. So I thought challenges, a challenge it invites, I think, resolution. I'm challenged to do this. I will think of some way of meeting the challenge. The first challenge is a separation of powers, which tends to be a shock for my students or student people who read the book, because we often associate separation of powers with democracy. But I make an argument in the book that, in fact, the, the institutional structure of separation of powers actually impedes both the responsiveness and the accountability of our democracy, and make an argument for a more parliamentary-like system, which I think is a superior institutional structure from a democratic point of view. Uh, the second challenge uh, I address is the imperial judiciary, uh, where I make an argument that uh, in spite of what a lot of liberals think about the, the Supreme Court and the judiciary, uh, if you look at the long-term history of the Supreme Court, it tends to take a pretty anti-democratic tack in most of its decisions, decisions that don't encourage the expansion of democracy but tend to impede it. And the institution itself is problematic from a democratic point of view in that you have nine unelected judges making uh, substantive policy decisions often overruling the will of elected legislators. And though I argue that might be appropriate in some circumstances, and I talk about that in the book, uh, as a general rule, uh, we ought to avoid that. Uh, we ought to let the problems of our society be solved through uh, elections, through elected rep and by elected representatives uh, who could be more responsive to the popular will. For the third challenge, I turn to our political culture and look at what I call radical individualism. Now, individualism has always been regarded as something very positive in American culture, and to a great extent it is. Americans want to think that they have some control and responsibility for their own lives, and I certainly don't want to uh, deny that. But I argue that American culture has evolved to an extent that we are perhaps too individualistic. Uh, Tocqueville would have said we are egoists. We, uh, uh, 
think about ourselves first and too little about the broader community. And so in that chapter, I make a case for less of the me first culture, but more of uh, we've got to think about uh, what's good for the common good and for the broader community. For a fourth challenge, I take up the challenge of political participation. And this is one that people are probably a little more familiar with. We all know that uh, voting participation is lower in America than we should expect, and I explore in the chapter some of the reasons why. Um, but also talk about other forms of participation, which have been also on decline in recent years, particularly participation in civic organizations and civic groups. Uh, I discuss at some length uh, a book by uh, Robert Putnam, a political scientist, called Bowling Alone, where he uh, it was published a number of years ago that sort of documented uh, the extent to which Americans don't join up in groups the way they, they used to. For the fifth challenge, uh, elections. And here I'm concerned with uh, uh, really three things. Uh, first, equal representation, and that's the bulk of the chapter, uh, where I raise questions about whether or not our elections provide the ideal of one person, one vote. Uh, and here, uh, that ideal is blocked by a number of factors, some of them institutional, the way institutions are structured. Uh, you take the uh, apportionment of the United States Senate, where each state, uh, no, no matter what their population, gets the same representation. Uh, that is far from the one person, one vote ideal. Uh, that means that somebody living in a low population state like Wyoming uh, has 60 times the electoral clout as somebody living in California. Uh, and that just doesn't really compute from a democratic point of view. And that carries over in the Electoral College, uh, which is another big structural impediment. Uh, uh, here we are a, a great democracy, but unlike most democracies who elect presidents, uh, we don't elect our president based upon winning a majority of the vote, of the popular vote, but in fact through this sort of weird institutional structure uh, that creates opportunities for people to win even though they lose the popular vote as George Bush did in 2000. Another aspect of unequal representation involves our, our system of funding elections. And this is something that certainly uh, undermines uh, equal representation, that some people can exert extra influence simply by their superior ability to finance candidates. That doesn't mean that elections are bought in America. Uh, that would be very hard to do. But it, what it means is that those people with monetary resources can influence greatly who the contenders in politics are. Uh, anybody can run for office, to be a, but to be a contender you need resources, an ability to get your name out there. And those people who can find m moneyed individuals to provide them contributions are more likely to become contenders uh, at whatever level of government they're running for office. The sixth challenge, which is uh, the privileged position of business. And here I take on uh, kind of an old chestnut in political science called pluralist theory, uh, which uh, argued for many years that uh, given the plurality of interest groups in American politics, uh, everybody, no matter who they are, uh, has a group to represent their interest. So that you have a widespread democracy because all these interest groups are contending for power and everybody has, some, has someone to speak for them. Uh, and I look at you know, a lot of empirical data and show that, well, that's certainly not true and no interest group trumps business groups who have great capacity to mobilize resources, to influence public opinion, uh, largely through their monetary resources, but also through their institutional positions. To go on to the seventh challenge, uh, that's economic inequality, which in some ways is kind of the opposite of business privilege. The one hand we have business privilege, and that business pri privilege to some extent has produced a economic system that at least over the last 30 years has produced growing economic inequality. Um, it is a big change from the American experience uh, prior to the 1970s when we saw decreasing inequality after World War II. 
really after the New Deal, uh, inequality in America was decreasing substantially. Uh, people at all income levels saw their incomes grow. And in fact, between 1947 and 1973, uh, the poorest Americans actually saw their income levels grow at a faster annual rate than the ri very richest Americans. Uh, that turned around uh, beginning at the end of the 1970s. Uh, and what we've seen since is uh, the poor Americans uh, falling behind and richer Americans uh, just uh, grabbing an increasing share of economic resources. And the final challenge uh, is the national security state. And by that I mean what Eisenhower called the military industrial complex. Uh, the fact that we have, since World War II, created an enormous military establishment compared to uh, all previous years in American history. Uh, there are a lot of good reasons for that. The Cold War, America's uh, presence in the world, its responsibilities around the world. Uh, nevertheless, we should ask questions about what does that do for our democracy. Uh, and I argue there are four uh, serious problems with national security state. Uh, one, the uh, national security state operates uh, through secrecy by and large. And in any democracy, making decisions in secret is something one should be concerned about. If you want the people to rule, the people need to have information. They need to know what's going on. And in much of our military and foreign policy, uh, that's, Americans are denied that information. A second problem with uh, the national security state is that it uh, results in a lot of centralization of decision making. Uh, we've basically evolved a system where the president has uh, pretty much unilateral power uh, to engage in uh, military action uh, without any kind of check or control. Um, whether it's uh, an invasion uh, or whether it's uh, ordering a drone strike, uh, which is sort of the latest uh, you know, concern. Another problem is uh, distortion. Uh, with the military industrial complex, you have the government essentially funding uh, institutions through uh, weapons pur purchases and uh, creating a huge weapons industry that in turn acquires tremendous political power. Also, you have uh, in the national security state uh, a military that I think in recent years has begun to take on a role that we haven't seen uh, in the American military uh, in the past where it uh, sees itself as a kind of a distinct institution. Uh, it's a voluntary army, uh, a voluntary military, uh, who uh, particularly in recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, have borne the burden for national conflict. And the vast part of the citizenry has not borne much burden. And I think that's a very problematic situation in a democracy, to have those who control physical force uh, to begin to think of themselves as perhaps a separate group apart from the rest of society. Finally, uh, the national security state uh, from its beginning is also engaged in political repression. When we get into conflicts, there's a tendency to see dissenters as traitors. And you have institutions uh, like the FBI or the National Security Agency or the CIA who are sort of tasked with the, with the responsibility of making sure that subversives or people without, with uh, intending harm in the United States are kept under control, uh, but they have often sort of interpreted their responsibilities a little too broadly. And so you have simply Americans who are interested in expressing their dissenting views, uh, monitored, uh, eavesdropped on, uh, and sometimes uh, even in prison uh, because of that. I hope their main takeaway from the book is that it undermines any complacency they might have about American politics and government. I think uh, overcoming complacency is the first step to political participation and political action. Uh, and that's another takeaway. I hope that the book uh, inspires students to uh, get involved in politics, to think about how they might uh, exercise some influence. Uh, that's why, even though the book 
is a critical look at American politics. I'm careful to uh, include in chapters uh, arguments about what might be done to improve things, to change things, to give a, a, a set of possible answers to the problems I identify. 